Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 19th of August. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, join the 28 pages mobilisation to stop terrorism. And the banker's solution in 2008 could blow up the financial system in 2016. All right, so first, Join the 28 pages, mobilisation to stop terrorism. Every viewer of this program is invited to call in to our office with the number on the screen or send us an email and get a copy of this magazine, this pamphlet that we produced last week that we've been promoting to stop a near-term terrorist attack. Read the 28 pages. Now, that's not exaggeration, Robbie, because when you look at this pamphlet, and you see what we've covered in here, as some of the US senators that were in, and congressmen who read the 28 pages said, oh my God, I have to completely transform, change, overturn how I look at these events of 9-11. Yep. Because what you see in that pamphlet is a documentation of the absolute collaboration of the Kingdom of Saudi Go uh, of Arabia government with the terrorists. Yep. And I think that that's, that's what's really shocking about this. And when we say, you know, stop the near-term terror, terror attacks, this is not an exaggeration. Well, it's not an exaggeration, Craig, because the United States House of Representatives Homeland Security Committee has released a report in July, it does monthly reports, and in July it ranked Australia and the United Kingdom equal third behind the United States and France on the list of likely targets of ISIS-inspired terrorism. Yeah, and I think if people are fed up with the politics of fear, yeah. if they're fed up of waking up in the morning and hearing, oh, there's been another terrorist attack, this pamphlet gives them the opportunity to get mobilised in a very, very you know, deliberate and actually quite easy way. Get copies of this pamphlet, take it to their local federal members, take it to their local community leaders, take it to their local police stations, ambulance centres and so forth, and get it circulating. And when they go to the, um, the, especially the members of parliament, Craig, because just to, just to make the point, this is our pamphlet, we've got information in here, but the, the centrepiece of this pamphlet is, we have the reproduction verbatim mm -hmm. of the 28 pages that were released. You can see, including with redacted lines, right? Yeah. They're, they're all in there. So you need to get your member of parliament and your police policeman, etc. But especially member of parliament, tell them they have to read those pages. All right, the rest is is what is back important information we provided. But read the pages for themselves so they can see what it is that we're talking about. Yeah. Because all the terrorist attacks you've mentioned that we've now just become used to. Unfortunately, it's it's the most horrible thing about the world at the moment. We're, we're getting used to it. They've all happened under the cloak of the cover-up of what's in this pamphlet. Yes. Uh, you, specifically, if you go back to 2002, right, which is when this the re original full congressional report was released, and these 28 pages were left out, it would not be possible for Australia to have joined the Iraq war. It no. wouldn't have been possible for Tony Blair to, you know, topple Saddam Hussein. We wouldn't have seen the whole policy of regime change in Libya, and in Syria today take place, we would not have seen, you could not have had possible the formation of ISIS without well, this problem. And I think the viewers should, you know, have a bit of a thought, just, just think of through that through themselves. If you knew in 2002, in two, early 2003, because the invasion of Iraq was March 2003, if you knew that while the governments, our governments were involved in planning this invasion, they had covered up 28 pages on the attack that made all this happen, 9-11, that said Saudi Arabia did it, yet we were being told we had to go into Iraq. Would anyone have tolerated that? No, of course not. Not on your life. And if you knew they were lying, they were covering that up, would anyone have accepted the lies about weapons of mass destruction? How could they? I mean, this was a crock. This was a, this was a, a line fed to destroy sovereign governments and to create the sort of destabilisation we have today. And this destabilisation complements the fact that the global financial crisis has never been solved and governments are trying to scramble in order to control their entire populations. We, we said back 
in uh, 2001, after the September 11 attacks, we said that all the raft of anti-terrorism legislation that was brought into so-called control terrorism by John Howard was part of a, an orchestrated police state methodology in order to not deal with terrorism, but in fact to deal with the uprising in a population yeah. where you've got massive economic austerity, massive economic collapse and so forth coming down the pike. And that's what we said. It's documented in our publications, economic development or fascist police state. And we've been proven absolutely correct. And 9-11 provided the pretext for that and the pretext for what we call permanent war in the form of these continuous regime change wars that well, have been on ever since. Yeah, the Dick Cheney, you know, neocons, permanent war, pe permanent revolution is actually a doctrine, Robbie, and that's what people don't understand. This idea of a permanent war, that peace is you know, not to be tolerated under any circumstance, that's actually a doctrine. And that's it's a very and it's a very profitable one if you're well, in the arms industry. Well, that's you know Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, uh, warned about the military-industrial complex in the United States and what you see today, the massive amount of money involved in the arms trade. And this this gets back to the you know what we want to talk about the fact that the 28 pages names Prince Bandar uh, as who was at that time the uh, the U.S. ambassador. Well, Craig, the, let me let me just recap what the yeah, go, the, go the, the, the gist of it. And then I want to just give the viewers um, some uh, a list of things that we're trying to get done on the back of this because it's not enough to have them released. The release has to be the basis of new action. So first of all, just to recap the the gist of it, these pages, the, the, the media, and the, one of the reasons we're doing this is because the media said when these pages were released, they either didn't report them as the Australian media didn't, or the U.S. media or the U.K. media said there's nothing new in them. Mm -hmm. That is a total lie. What they say. They repeatedly name Prince Banda, Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States, and his wife as having provided funding for the 9-11 attack. And they reveal that they transfer those, transferred those funds from an account at the Riggs Bank in Washington, D.C. to Saudi intelligence officers in San Diego who assisted two of the 9-11 hijackers. That's in the 28 pages. That evidence there then, then goes somewhere else. It doesn't, that's not just a confirmation of Saudi Arabia's role. It implicates Saudi Arabia's business partner in arms dealing and war, the British government, including the royal family. Because as we then provide the other documentation related to investigation about the Al Yamama arms for oil deal, the UK Ministry of Defence authorised BAE Systems to transfer money from a regularly from a confidential Bank of England bank account to Prince Bandar's account at the Riggs Bank in Washington, D.C., from which he funded these Saudi officers who assisted the 9-11 hijackers. The British government's involved in this, and when the Serious Fraud Office in the UK was investigating this in 2006 and stumped, started to get onto that part of it, Tony Blair intervened and shut it down. And the reason we know that part of it is because the Guardian newspaper dug up some of that information that the, had come up in the Serious Fraud Office investigation and reported it in mid-2007. That's why what now has... To, that is devastating material. So this is not just... The cover-up was not just a cover-up of the Saudis, it was a cover-up of the British Saudis. And that's why it relates directly to us in Australia, the United States, etc. These This is done through intelligence agencies and all our intelligence agencies work together. And they are implicated in the worst scourge that's afflicting, afflicting humanity at the moment. So what we need is a new commission in the United States to re-look at the whole 9-11 picture from the standpoint of this new information and look as part of that at the cover-up of this information. That's now part of the story. That's what has to happen in the United States. Our government should be pressuring the US government to do that. US citizens should be pressuring their own government to do that. The United Kingdom must reopen the Serious Fraud Office investigation to Aldi Mama. They have to do that. If, then, if, the, if the Theresa May government in the United Kingdom does not reopen that investigation in the light of this, these 28 pages and the Chilcot report, she, her government, is implicated in ongoing terrorism. It's as simple as that. So they have to do that. UK citizens must demand they do that. The Australian government must demand that the UK government do that. What's more, we're calling for the UK Parliament. Don't leave this up to a sort of like a bureaucratic inquiry. They're the representatives of the people, form their own parliamentary commission to look at Al Yamama and assert the rights of the people in this situation by demanding everyone involved come and testify, Craig, 
including His Royal Highness Prince Charles, future King of England and Australia. He must be made to testify because he's not just good buddies with Bandar, he doesn't just manage personally the al Mama arms negotiations, but through his Oxford Centre of Islamic Studies, he rubs shoulders and is close to about eight leading figures from the Middle East and Saudi Arabia implicated in terrorism. Right? Yep. This crime cannot be covered up any longer. You are at risk. Anyone in Australia is at risk. In the UK is at risk. In Europe is at risk. In the United States is at risk. Any time from a random attack, you, you or your loved ones can be killed by this scourge that's been un, that was unleashed by these guys years ago and has been covered up ever since. Robbie, I think it's important to note that this re release of the 28 pages happened just after the US Congress went into recess. Yes. Now they're about to come back. We're about to look in a couple of weeks' time at the anniversary of 9-11. So there's been you know, calls or discussion about calling on the government to impanel a grand jury to reopen these 28 pages, not just the 28 pages, but the entire report. There's 80,000 pages in of documentation Florida. in Florida, which has been reviewed at a federal court, which has now been uh, called on to be released. So there's a massive mobilisation going on in the US right now, but because the Congress is not back in, uh, in, in session at the moment, you know, there's not much motion in the terms of the you know, over, overt visi visible motion, but there's a, it's like a tsunami underneath yeah. Starting to break out. And we, and, we break will, out. And, and we are playing a key role. We've got associates in the US doing their work. We have to do, do it in Australia and the UK. So call in, get yourself a copy of this, order multiple copies if you're prepared to pass it on to people. Make sure that you get at least enough copies to give to your local police and the local member of parliament and tell them what um, we just said. That is the mobilisation we're on. You personally, the viewer, can play a role in stopping terrorism. Because it's not just an organic, you know, evolved phenomenon that's just, you know, mushroomed up. It's a specific strategy that's been allowed to happen under the cover, under a cover up. All right, we better take a break, Craig, yeah, and better. change the subject. Welcome back to the CEC report. The banker's solution in two thousand and eight could blow up the financial system in 2016. So Craig, yesterday we put out a press release to the, with a similar headline, Bankers' Solution to Derivatives Danger Could Bring Down International Financial System. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about is this: the, what the bankers came up with to solve the derivatives threat to the economy, which it was the derivatives implosion that caused the 2008 global financial crisis. So just, just explain to the viewer what derivatives are. Well, derivatives, Robbie, are basically paper instruments. They're financial instruments that don't, have an, don't actually have a physical value. They have a paper value, a financial value. For example, people go and buy shell, shares and so forth on the stock market. You get a share, you get, actually get a share in a company. However, the next level of a derivative would be an option on a share. Yeah. Right, and in the Lehman Brothers collapse of, of back in 2008, what you're dealing with are these things called collateralized debt obligations, where these mortgages, non-performing mortgages, were all bundled up into a package, and it wasn't those that were sold; it was the rights to the income stream for those that were sold. So you're buying the rights to something that actually you don't actually have mm -hmm. any physical um, uh, right to. Right, you have the right to the income stream. So that's what derivatives are. And They're the basically got transferred to people many times removed from the actual transaction. And, and these income streams are sold and countersold and sold on, and to the point that quite often with the derivatives, people don't know where the 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 end of, who who holds the end of them. And that's where the problem is because the the establishment, the Bank of International Settlements, and others recognise that there's a real danger that no one knows where these things are actually going to end up having to be paid out or you know, require Cause the settling worst, out. The worst of these derivatives, Craig, are these over-the-counter derivatives, and they, the, the banks trade these things among <coughs> each other, and so you have what's called counterparty risk. Oh, yeah, counterparty risk. These things are off balance sheets, Robbie. The banks don't have them, they're, they're private deals that are done, and they create risks in the banking system that no one knows of. So what the Bank of International Settlements and other central banks have said, we have to have a system. So they created these central counterparty clearing houses whereby they're trying to bring all that risk into one place to try and manage it. But the problem is that the Bank of International Settlements has just come out in the last week and said 
it's not working. Yeah. The whole system that we've tried to create just won't work. And if you're looking at a $600 trillion financial bubble of derivatives and debt and so forth, there's no mechanism today in the world that can handle any significant or large too big to fail bank that can falls over because of their exposure to these gambling debts, these derivatives. Now, what, what happened, Craig, was in 2008, there was an argument that, and, and a proper argument, that this you know, was, okay, this is all blown up in our faces. We should, this should all be scrapped, right? People like us, the American physical economist, Lyndon LaRouche, called for cancelling derivatives, get rid of them, right? Get them out of the system. Well, they were illegal. But yeah. Back before the 90s, these things were illegal. They were seen as gambling. You could go to jail for trading in them. And the way to get them out of the system is instead of trying to make every single type of derivative illegal, the way to get them out of the system is to establish the Glass-Steagall separation of investment banking that gets into that stuff from the real economy. And that way, whatever happens over there, it could have the biggest blow up of all time. Nothing's going to happen to the real economy, to people's savings, etc. That's what should have happened after 2008. Instead, they said, no, 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 we've got to have these things. They're so wonderful. It's called... Um, well, they, they, they package them up like insurance policies. Because the system is so deregulated, you think got these things like interest rate derivatives, interest rate swaps, credit default swaps, and all these things that are packaged up as so-called insurance on trading over currencies and international trade because the entire system has become so deregulated. Yeah. And Australia has got an enormous pool of these things. Something like, was it 32 trillion now? Of and that's, we've, we've had the fastest growth since 2008, 14 trillion to 32 trillion dollars. You know, these instruments that actually never existed before the 1990s. And Craig, this question of risk and, and threat is looming large because of Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank's one of the biggest derivatives riddled banks in the world and it's been called by the German press a dead bank walking, but it's got all this counterparty risk. You'll see a graphic on the screen that shows the web with Deutsche Bank in the middle where it's got all this counterparty risk to all the other big, too big to fail banks in the world. And if Deutsche Bank goes down, it could bring the whole system down. And in these mechanisms, these central clearing, cent clearing houses, central um, counterparties that they set up are gonna be the risk themselves that brings down the system. That's the warning. And yeah. the business inside of the Australian publication, um, the way they put it, is that this, these groups like the um, uh, Bank for International Settlements Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures and the International Organisation of Securities Commissions that have now put out a report on these central clearing counterparties saying there's a problem here. The way the Business Insider put it was this survey is slightly terrifying because if the clearing houses don't work, derivatives are, quote, just unexploded nuclear bombs nestling deep in the financial system. That's what we're sitting on right now, and that's what, uh, you know, what's his name? Deutsche Bank is this out of control uh, fuse hurtling towards, right? Well, that's what Warren Buffett recalled to derivatives, you know, several years ago, weapons of mass destruction. So let's, ha let's take a quick break, and we're going to talk about the, there is, a, you know, the, let's go back to the alternative glass steagall. Welcome back to the CEC report where we're talking about the banker's solution in 2008 could blow up the financial system in 2016. And Craig, before the break, we just went through what we put in out in our press release, people get to our website. Um, this week, banker's solution to derivatives danger could bring down international financial system. And that's a real threat now. The mechanism they set up of um, central counterparties is now the danger to the system. So let's talk about the real solution. As we discussed before the break, glass steagall and what we want to do is play you a video because because glass steagall craig, craig just quickly define it for the well viewer. it's a law it was, it was established after the last depression by roosevelt which said look we can't have all this speculation in the banking system so we have to have a strong commercial banking system where it protects people's deposits and it's used for the boring business of banking and it's got to be separated out from all the vertical integration as you hear the greens talk it which is investment houses merchant banking stockbroking stock houses insurance companies and so forth that are at the present time all under one roof particularly in this country in the big banks, break the two apart, have separate boards, yeah. and if they want to, if they want to go off and speculate and have merchant bank, that's fine. We'll put a one point oh one percent transaction tax on all speculation as well. That's another thing that we should yeah, do yeah. in order to, to increase the tax base. But the point is that that's what that's the principle. It's not complicated, Robbie. It's one of the most simple policies out. So we've got very good news, which we've also reported here recently, which is the progress that's happening around the world 
as these other op solutions, as the banker solutions are all obviously failing, people are saying, giving up their resistance and saying, yep, Glass-Steagall. And so we're going to play a little clip by a US show called The Undercurrent, taken behind the scenes of the Democratic National Convention in the United States a couple of weeks ago, where they interviewed very prominent members of Congress, very prominent. High, Americans would recognise them, the average Australian might not, but they're very well known. And just look at the consensus forming on Glass-Steagall in the United States. Do you support reinstating Glass-Steagall to break up the too big to fail banks? I think it's good to, I, I support doing that. We might want to update that. We have to look at it, but yes, there should be more separation. Yeah. Well, I think Glass-Steagall uh, obviously is, has been very controversial uh, because the big banks said they had to have this uh, to be competitive. I think what uh, people believe is uh, that unfortunately that has undermined the safety of uh, people's savings. Uh, and people's investments. And so I think it's going to be looked at in that context. I'm sure it'll be very controversial. We'll have a lot of debate about it. We have not healed what caused our economic disaster. Uh, and one of the reasons why is a lot of these banking practices that have to be changed. So I think it was a mistake uh, to get rid of Class steagall and we need to re come back as a country and say, what are we going to allow to do? By the way, other countries don't have this kind of Canada, for example, is a great uh, model in terms of that they don't allow the kind of outrageous leveraging uh, and risk um, that puts our whole economy in peril. So we have a lot of work to do, and I'm glad to hear the Republican Party coming around to it. But by the way, that's not that's not what I'm hearing from the senators, uh, the majority of the Senate. So we have a lot more work to do. We should basically go back to a glass seagull and repeal the undoings that, that happened and cause a lot of our problems. And so you support breaking up the too big to fail banks? Oh, I've always been that way. I've always felt very strong about that. You know, we're right now our little community banks and those of us who live in rural states, community community banks are getting punished for the for the absolute outrageous behavior of the large banks, Wall Street banks. And it's really hurt mainstream America. Too big to fail is too big to exist. One of the goals we had when we passed Dodd Frank was uh, to, to uh, break up the too big to fail. We, we failed. Uh, the, the six largest banks in the country at the time of the 2008 collapse are actually larger today. And if one of the big banks collapsed, I can guarantee you it would be so impactful that the government would have to step in. We thought the glass steagall should never have been removed. The banks without governors, uh, they were free to to destroy and they, they, they just the blanks need checks and balances. That's where they need governors. That's where the Glass Deagle Act should be restored. And Craig, as one of those senators, Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker from New Jersey, um, in the middle of that clip said, he acknowledged that the Republicans have come on board because mm -hmm. the Republican Party also adopted Glass Steagall in their platform. And now this is starting to become overwhelming and hard to resist. And if that happens um, you finally got a solution in place that can stop the, the kind of threat that we just talked about before the break. And this is going to be incredibly important for Australia. We had Bill Short and come out public before the election saying, no, no we're not going to go with Glass-Steagall. So, Robert, he's going to ignore the two major parties in the US where this is becoming like a, a steamroller now, this policy. No, people. We've been on this campaign for several years now. Glass-Steagall is coming onto the agenda in Australia because it is absolutely necessary to save our uh, four too big to fail banks and it's absolutely needed to re-establish what's needed in, in our uh, economy. Yeah. All right, so let's end there. Just a reminder, call in for your copy of this pamphlet and join our campaign to stop terrorism. Thanks for tuning in. Tune in next week for more CEC Report.